Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. So the topic of my lesson is, let's throw the title up on the screen here, Adventures in Loving People. All right, and for those of you, I hear the corner back there, um, there's going to be bonus content for those of you who already sat through the five-week Sunday school class. But first of all, I want to announce that we do have a new way that we are loving people here at All Nations Church, a very specific group of people. And that is those who have lost a loved one. If you've lost a loved one and you're grieving that, and by lost, I mean they died, and they're out of your life. You've lost a loved one. So there is this whole process of grieving, and it's best not done alone. So we're starting a grief support group next month in july it'll be on wednesday nights we've got a table set up out there in the hallway miss tina pate and myself will be facilitating this group and it's in depth and spiritual and very helpful um, we have some professionals uh, renowned professionals in the christian area of grief support on video there's an intensive workbook there's a $15 charge, you get the book. It's a $100 value, but for only $15 for the uh, workbook. But that's the kind of thing then through Bible study, you're, you'll grind through it during the week. We'll get together and have the a grief support group, the conversations. If this sounds like something that you would need, even if somebody just passed away recently, maybe through the pandemic, or it's been a few years, but you feel like, you know what, I never dealt with that. I know one local woman who went through a grief support group. She was a pastor's wife at another church here in town. And it wasn't until they kind of nominated her, we need you to lead this grief support group, that she realized she had never dealt with the grief from the death of her own mother. And all of that came up and she realized, you know what, I've never, I've just buried it but it was leaking out in different areas of her life in ways that she hadn't connected until she started to do the work on it. But anyway, that's starting in July. Again, all the details are out there at the table. I'll head out there to the table and Tina Pate will be out there. And if that's something you're interested in or you know somebody who you're thinking, you know what, they could really use that, even if they're not a part of All Nations Church, then let them know and let's have this group. But that is another way of loving people is to help them through this time of their life, through grief. All right, so put the title back up there. Adventures in Loving People, it says there, love one another. We know that we're supposed to love one another. It says there, love your neighbor. Jesus even said, love your enemy. But the question is, as you see there, but how? How are we supposed to love people? Now you could come up with 12 practical tips for loving people better, and then you could just work harder and try harder and really try to muster up this love for other people. You could do that, but here's what I'm saying is you don't know how to love people because you don't know what they need. Really only God knows what they need because you don't really know them that well. I mean, I raised four children. And how well do I really know them? But God knows them, and God knows them all better than they know themselves. So how are we going to love people? We're commanded to love people, but how are we going to do it? Like I said, you could try to white-knuckle it and work harder, but since you don't really know how to love them, that's not going to work. So what will work? Well, the good news is that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come into us if you're a born-again believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is in you. And he said that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And that includes how to love people. You don't know how to love people. I mean, if you think, oh, well, I've got a really good handle on it. I mean, just start at the very first person standing at the corner when you leave church who's asking you to give them something. How to love them. 
Well, you don't know how to love them because you don't know the backstory. You don't know where they were last night or the day before. You don't know, really know what they need. You know what they're asking for, but how to best love them, you don't know. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit, but the good news is the Holy Spirit will lead us. He will teach us all things. So what we need to do is to be able to hear from God better. All right, well, the good news is the Bible says that love is a fruit of the Spirit. So out of our relationship with God, Jesus said this, the kingdom of God is like a seed which a man took and planted in his garden and the tree grew and it became a large tree and the birds of the air came and nested in its branches. So my question is, how long does it take a seed to grow into a tree and a tree so great that birds find it safe to build a home in. How long does that take? Years, it takes years. There's the good news, you can have patience with yourself if you don't think you're growing fast enough in God. It takes years. The kingdom of God is like a seed that's planted. Jesus used all sorts of organic examples in the Bible. And he said that he's the vine, we're the branches. That's an organic example. But these things grow slowly, but they do grow. And here's one of the interesting things about a seed. If the kingdom of God is like a seed that's planted within us, or you could say it's the Holy Spirit that comes inside of us, seeds always grow in two directions. What are they? <laughs> up and down. Seeds always grow up, which we all see that growth, but seeds also always grow down because they build a root system. So let's say I took an apple seed, I bought an apple there at the grocery store and I took a seed out and I had this little pot and I put it in some dirt. All right, I'll just wait now and pretty soon. So look, here's my question for you. You got it in your little pot, you put it up there in your window, at work maybe, right there at your corner office. How long until you have apples? How long? Uh, listen, it's a trick question. If you have it in your little pot, you will never get apples, unless you have some weird pygmy apple tree of some kind, but you'll never get apples because it can't be in that little pot because it'll never grow the root system that it needs. You, you, at some point, you'll, even if you start in the pot, you're gonna have to get it out. It's gonna have to have space to grow the root system. All right, well, the kingdom of God is like a seed. This is seed is the Holy Spirit planted in you. He's the vine, we are the branches. We're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, et cetera, et cetera, but starting with love, we're gonna bear the fruit of love. The question is, how are we supposed to love people? You don't know, the Holy Spirit's gonna teach you. You're gonna bear the fruit. It takes time to bear the fruit, but you have to have the root base. Now, if you ever go out to, say, Esposito's or one of these garden places and you want to talk to them about your little apple tree that you planted and it's in your window at your office and it's, you're not getting any apples, they're going to say, they're going to use a phrase. It's the phrase root bound. They're going to say, well, you know, you're never going to get apples because your, your roots, you don't have any space to grow the roots. It's root bound. All right. If you're not bearing the fruit of love, like are you loving people like you should? Or do you have the joy? Do you have the peace? Do you have the patience? Do you have the self-control that you wish you had? All the fruit of the Spirit? If you don't have all of those the way you would like them, it's probably because your spiritual life is root-bound. All right, let's call it the next slide. Well, there it is. Do the root work. All right, so you can't see it that well. I feel like I'm like a weatherman now. <laughs> All right, so there's the tree above ground, and that's what we see. We see other people, and they, they, we can see what they are like on the outside above ground, but what you can't see is what they are like below ground. Now, you will know over time because you'll know them by their fruit. So over time, you'll be able to see, but you can see underneath ground is this amazing root system. I mean, that's a beautiful root system right there. And it's bigger than the tree above ground. 
So this tree is not root bound, it's the opposite. It has lots of space to grow. How does this apply to your spiritual life? Your walk with God, he's the vine, you're just the branches, he's the vine, he's the, our relationship with God is the root base. How are you doing the root work? In other words, how are you building your root base in your spiritual life? You can't be root bound, you can't be in a little pot so this represents your relationship with God. How are you going to grow your relationship with God? How are you gonna grow your relationship with any human? Time, it's gonna to have to be time. You wanna have a better relationship with your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your coworkers. It's gonna be time. A lot of leaders, even at a secular workplace, will be like, all right, we're all going to get together for breakfast on Saturday morning outside of the workplace. Why would you do that? Time together is what's going to help grow that team. Well, you and the Holy Spirit are like a team. How are you going to grow that relationship? It's gonna have to be time with God. That's how you're gonna do the root work. So you won't have to try to figure out, how am I supposed to love these people? The guys on the street, the people that I work with, how am I supposed to love them? Don't even try to figure out how to love them. Get alone with God and the Holy Spirit will teach you how to love them because you're going to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but it's gonna come out of your relationship with him, which comes out of your time with him. You've got to spend time with God. I promote this idea of having a time and a place. Those of you who are exercisers, you go to the gym, you watch your Jack LaLanne videos on YouTube from the old days, um, if I ask you your time and your place, you probably have one. Like you say, oh, go to the gym every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 6 a.m., all right? You've got a time, you've got a place. Yeah, if people who are serious about exercising, they always have a time and a place. And people who aren't serious, you're gonna know, they're gonna be like, well, you know, it's a, you know, whenever I, okay, got it, all right. And you can tell the fruit of people who exercise, right? It's above ground, it's pretty clear. You can see, well, you're an exerciser, you're not. You didn't have to tell me. All right, well, it also shows up in your spiritual life. And if somebody says, well, I don't really pray or read the Bible, now don't say it because it's not very loving, but you could say, well, you didn't have to tell me. <laughs> um, I can see you're not doing the root work. You're not spending time with God because it just leaks out of you when you do. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And like, you can't stop it. It's just going to come out of you, all the fruit of the Spirit, including loving other people. So I promote, let's go to the next slide, what we call the Matthew 6-6 principle. And you can see there's a one, two, three, and a one, two, three. The Matthew 6-6 principle, I'll go ahead and read literally what Matthew 6-6 says. You know what, I didn't even put it in my notes. All right, well basically it says, uh, but you, when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 6, 6 in its entirety. But I'm pulling out three points. And this is how you do the root work. This is how you build your relationship with God. This is how you spend more time with God. It's pretty simple. Number one, go into your room. Number two, shut your door. Number three, pray to your father. And the great thing is the end of that verse says your father will reward you. I'm in. Go into your room, shut your door, pray to your father. But sometimes I have people get legalistic about that and they're like, well, I don't even have a room. You know, well, I don't even have a door. I'm like, okay, well, let's make it something that will apply to other situations. So I put it this way. Number one, get alone. Really, going to your room is just symbolic of get alone. You're like, well, I'd rather play, pray out in the woods or on a prayer walk. Do it then. Just get alone. Shut out distractions. Like some people say, oh, well, I'm not a child. I don't have to close my eyes when I pray. Well, it's true. You don't have to close your eyes when you pray. It's absolutely true. But it is a way to shut out distractions. You know, if you're at home and you're looking around, you're like, oh, Father, oh, I need to dust that. Look at that. Mm -mm -mm. You know, or then uh, you're like, God, I'm drawing near to you right now. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh-oh, what's that? Oh, a notification. 
oh, look at that. You know, they're having spaghetti for breakfast. Shut out the distractions. And that's where closing your eyes can't help. It can help shut out distractions. So you, you uh, what was it again? Get alone. <laughs> shut out the distractions and just talk to God. Just talk to him. So I'm not saying develop a prayerful attitude. I'm not saying be meditative. I'm saying talk to the real, live, living God. Just turn your attention to him and just literally talk to him. Sometimes at Thanksgiving, you'll see a lot of uh, people saying or posting things like, you know, just be, have a thankful attitude. And I'm always thinking, who are they thanking? Well, in this case, be thankful to God. So you're spending time with God and you're literally talking to him. And then, you know, whatever you want to say there. But now you're developing the relationship with God. And we could talk on and on about what you should be doing in your prayer time uh, but that'll be for another lesson. What's going to happen, though, is James 4, 8, you're drawing near to God. He's drawing near to you. Hebrews eleven six. 6, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you have your time and your place. You're doing the root work. You're building your relationship with God. Through that, he is going to help you bear the fruit of the spirit of love. And that's how you're going to love other people, which is the top commandment that we're supposed to be doing anyway, loving other people. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. John 14, 26 says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Galatians 5, 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So this is how we're going to love other people. We're going to grow our relationship with God. And then we're not going to worry about how to love other people because we just will. Does that make sense? The fruit will come, but you can't have it in a little pot. Because the fruit won't come, it'll be root bound. So what does that mean? Grow the root base. It means spending more time with God. How much time? I'm not going to give you an amount, but I'll say probably a little more. Probably a little more. You start, it starts to feel a little awkward, probably a little more. All right, so uh, those of you who went through the class, you heard all these things. Those are all the main points. And I do want to close with this, because even though I said that you don't need 12 practical tips for loving people, that you just need to get closer to God, we are going to close quickly with 12 practical tips <laughs> for loving people. All right, so number one, I love you and want God's best for you. All right, that is something that you need to be able to say about every human in the world. That if you're walking, driving, the guy in front of you, it turns green and he doesn't go. I'm talking about you should be able to look at every single human being and say, I love you and want God's best for you. Just let that become your mantra in life. I love you and want God's best for you. If you can look at every single person and be able to say that, that's God. God's going to be the one who empowers that to work through you. But that is a mentality to adopt. And it doesn't mean I love you and want my best for you. It means I love you and I want God's best for you. All right, so point number two. Go the extra mile. It's so simple, but this is just a practical tip for loving people. You're like, I don't even know, you know, about this loving people. Well, Jesus gave us this one. Go the extra mile. In that case, in those days, as it's explained to me, is that Jesus was talking about the Roman soldiers who could conscript somebody on the spot and say, you know, carry my gear for a mile. All right. How annoying. You were busy. You had things to do. And all of a sudden, somebody's grabbing you out of the crowd and saying, carry this for a mile. How horrible. And yet Jesus is saying, oh, when they do that, say, all right, hey, you know what? You won't, at the end of the mile, you won't have to try to conscript somebody else. I'll just, we'll go too. How about that? And I love this modern illustration. There's a Hall of Fame baseball player named Ernie Banks. And Ernie Banks had this little motto because when baseball players sometimes have double headers, two games in one day, you know that most of them would be like, oh gosh, one of these horrible, it's like doing twice the work in one day. But Ernie Banks would always say, it's a great day for a ball game, let's play two. 
Well, just adopt that in your mindset of going the extra mile with someone instead of thinking, oh, this is so annoying. They want me to do this. They need help with that. Oh, it's so annoying. I guess I'll help them, but I'm going to be grudge it until the very end. But going the extra mile, it's just a simple way to show love to people. Oh, you need a little help with that? Oh, you need me to uh, stack five chairs? I'll stack 10 chairs <laughs> or whatever. All right, next tip is when someone shows you how to love them and you can easily do it, just do it. It takes a lot of brain power out of the equation because sometimes all of a sudden it's very clear, you know, like at my house, a lot of grandkids running around. If all of a sudden one of them is standing there at the sink and they've got a cup of water and they want some water. Well, they've just showed me how to love them. I'm standing right there. It would only take a second. How easy is that? Now, if somebody comes up to you and you, you just picked a quarter up off the sidewalk, you shoved it in your pocket. I've got that quarter right here. I don't know if I need a quarter. And, and you take five steps and somebody says, sir, can I have a quarter? Well, they just showed you how to love them and you can easily do it. It's literally right there. Well, then you don't have to weigh that out. Just do it. This is just a practical tip, how to love people when they show you how to love them. I used the illustration the other day, my grandson, not to me, but came up to one of the ladies in the house with a diaper, and he just laid down on the floor and spread out his legs. All right. He was showing how you could love him. And you can easily do it. That's the part that got me off the hook. It's like, mm. I have an illustration. I love this story. So I was at a store in town here called Junkalicious. That's what I call it. They sell things by the pound. And I found this Miami Dolphins baseball cap. So I bought this cap. I thought, well, that's a pretty cool cap. I'm walking out of the store, and I hear this voice behind me going, hey, boss. If any, any, especially you men, have you ever had somebody come up behind you and say, hey, boss. Like, it's never good. <laughs> hey, boss. I'm like, oh, go the extra mile. So I turn around and this young man is behind me and he said, hey, I saw you bought that Miami Dolphins hat. I'm like, yeah? He said, well, I want to know if I could buy it from you. I'm like, oh, well, you know, that, that's good. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you two things. First of all, I'm going to give you a lesson. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the hat. You don't have to buy it. I said, and here's the lesson. When someone shows you how to love them and you can easily do it, just do it. And you just showed me how to easily love you and so I'm going to do it. Here's the hat. So if, if, if it's just a practical tip, if it's just obvious right there, just do it. All right, number four. This one is a really deep one. I've talked about this before, but preemptive forgiveness. How to love people. This is very practical and maybe more difficult. Preemptive forgiveness means you forgive them before they wrong you, before they hurt you, before they, I mean, and how do I do it? I do it in the mornings when I'm praying. I just pray and, and, and uh, uh, God, uh, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me and I forgive them all right now, past, present, and future. What this does is it gets personal offense out of the equation. Because how many times do people get offended? We're living in an offense-based society. People are divided. People get offended about anything and everything. You can get the personal offense out of the equation because you just can't love people when you're offended. So if we, a practical tip for loving people is just go ahead and forgive them. Get that off the table. So you're saying, all right, you know what? Somebody's gonna do something dumb today. They're going to say something dumb today, but you know what, Lord, I forgive them right now. I just get that part out of the table, off the table, so that I don't have to like wallow in that or receive that or, or bear that burden. I'm set free to love them and want God's best for them by getting personal offenses out of the equation ahead of time. Jesus said, it's impossible that no offenses should come. They're coming. Something's going to offend you. Through preemptive forgiveness, you can just get that off the table, take yourself and your ego and your self-esteem, your personal offenses out of the equation so that you're set free to love them. Okay, number five. 
is proactive prayer. So we have preemptive forgiveness, proactive prayer. Sometimes we just get surprised by things that shouldn't surprise us in life. If you'll just stop and think for a few minutes, who am I going to be around today? And then pray for those people. Or you think ahead, all right, who am I going to be around this summer? Uh, who am I going to be around in the fall? Maybe if you're involved in education, you're always involved with new people every fall. Who am I? You, you start by praying for them in advance. And that's just a very simple tip. All right, next one. Hallway discipleship. This applies here at church, especially. The idea of hallway discipleship. I'll say it this way. Don't be in such a hurry to vacate the building. You're supposed to love people. Look around. They're here. Like as soon as you get in the car and leave, now you're not around any of these people. And you say, well, you know, I'd like to be involved with discipling other people, but I don't even know how to do it. Well, you know what? Hang around in the hall for a little bit. Hallway discipleship. You can share an encouraging word with somebody. You can ask somebody, how are you doing? How's it going? And here we are, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're called to love one another. It says they'll know we are Christians by our love. But I remember, you know, many, many years ago, we would come here on Wednesday nights. We lived farther away from the church. The kids were in youth group. We had uh, four children here, and I would say this, as soon as like 8 o'clock hit, I'd be like, get to the car. <laughs> get to the car. I'd say, every second's a minute. Every, se you, every second it takes us to get to the car, we're going to be home a minute later. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that today. I look back and I'm like, mm, okay, I mean, I know they need to get to bed and do whatever, but hallway discipleship. Plant that in your mind about just the value of saying hello to somebody, saying how you're doing, and you might not think it's very much, but it's something. All right, number eight. This one is called, list, no, seven. Oops, sorry about that. Listening is loving. Rick Warren said this, God is giving you a healing instrument. It's your ears. He said, sometimes just by listening to people, they feel loved. Years ago, I heard this illustration when a guy goes into the bar and he's drinking and he's pouring out his sorrows to the bartender. And next thing you know, by the end of the night, he's like hugging the bartender and saying, you're the best friend I ever had. Why would he say that? Because the bartender seemingly was listening to him as he poured out his woes. So I, listening is loving. I just heard this quote this week. Three of the most powerful relationship building words you can ever say are, tell me more. Instead of being like, okay, gotta go. Every second's a minute. <laughs> tell me more. Listening is loving. Okay, now number eight. This one's called, there you are. What if every time you saw somebody, anybody, your reaction was, there you are. I'm so happy to see you today. How's it going? And I picked up this illustration because many years ago, I was at a uh, little Christian school basketball game and I was talking to a mom and the mom's uh, little daughter came up and the mom just sparkled and said, there you are, and grabbed her child. And I was like, oh, wow, what? wouldn't it be nice to always be greeted that way? There you are. Because have you ever looked at somebody and, been, and they immediately make you grumpy? Like, oh my gosh, it's that person again. You're at the grocery store and you see him turn the aisle down at the other end. You're like, time to check out. But what if on the other hand, we loved everybody and wanted God's best for them. And so now we're literally saying, there you are. Wouldn't that feel great? And it feels good for you. These are just practical tips. All right. Number nine, the little generosities, just the little things. Like I said about if you had a quarter in your pocket and you give somebody a quarter, you hold the door open for somebody. You give somebody a little smile. These aren't big things. They're just the little generosities. Sometimes under this category, I put this little lesson. I saw this and thought of you, so I bought it. That's just a little generosity. I saw this, I thought of you, and I bought it. So once again, yesterday I was at this store called Junkalicious that I called Junkalicious. And I saw this little pair of Timberland boots. These nice leather boots. 
I mean, they're only about five inches long, so, you know, it would be for a very special person. But I got them with my grandson in mind. And so I came home with these boots, and he fell in love with these boots. He put them on. I said, you know, they might be a little small. <laughs> a few minutes later, I said, do you feel your toe touching the end of the boots? And he literally said this, they're feeling better every second. <laughs> So the little generosities, I saw these and I thought of you. And so you can, you can just do that literally. You're like, oh, well, it's going to cost me a dollar or two or whatever. But I saw this and I thought of you. It's a little generosity, but it's a practical tip for loving people. All right. Next one is much more complicated. Your part in the body. We all have a part in the body of Christ. What's your part in the body of Christ? This is a little bit of the upside down version of find out someone else's love language. This case, it's what is your calling for loving other people? What are your passions? What are your interests? What are you good at? All right, instead of trying to necessarily think of, oh, how do I love you? I got to get to know you a little better. No, nothing wrong with all that. Um, but instead, it's like, God, what are you calling me to do? God, what have you gifted me to do? God, what passion have you put in my heart? And now how can I add this to the world? So now you're operating out of your passion, not necessarily their love language, but your love language. Because if somebody comes up to you and it's not really your love language, and you're like, oh, well, you know, you gave me a hug and I didn't really want the hug, but still some, and I don't, by the way. <laughs> But some people, uh, they, they are just huggers. And so it, I really wouldn't want that person to be sitting there going, I wonder if this is his love language. It would be better for you to just operate out of your love language and just spew it all over the world. You loving other people in your God-gifted way. All right, so number 11 see through their eyes and i do want to read a little quote this is from henry ford i read this many years ago in a book called how to win friends and influence people by dale carnegie it's not a christian book but certainly operating by christian principles such as the golden rule for example but he said this and this was talking about just secular business success but it applies to our christian lives if there's any one secret of success that should make your ears perk up if there's any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. So if you're ever thinking a critical thought of somebody like, why would they do that? Well, maybe just stop and think for a minute like, well, what is their point of view? And this is where listening will also come in and help. What were they thinking? Well, what was behind all that? We're trying to love other people. Sometimes a chasm grows between us and them because we don't know what they're doing. It's aggravating. But if you stop, for example, back to the illustration of somebody at the stoplight, it turns green, they're right in front of you, you're in a hurry, and they're not pulling out fast enough. And then you're like, they're on their phone. How dare they? But if you just stop and think, because you're thinking, what, what are they doing on their phone? Well, you know, they're probably not playing words with friends or whatever people are playing anymore. You know, maybe it was something important. Um, I'll be at the hospital as soon as I can get there. You know, I mean, you don't know what it is, but if you just stop and think for just a second about the other person's point of view, it can help you love them better. And finally, number 12, which is don't stress about it. So I go back to the very first thing I said is you don't know how to love people. So don't stress about it. Like don't get all worried like, oh, I should be loving people more. I should be loving people better, but I'm not very good at it. And I don't know how to do it. Back to the thing I started with. It's a fruit of the spirit. You don't have to muster up more fruit of the spirit. You just have to build your root base so that you will bear the fruit of the spirit. Does that make sense? All right. Well, that is the end. I hope that you will practice this and do the root work, spend more time with God, and then watch the fruit of the Spirit grow. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? 
Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.